Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, this is JP Mason. And uh, we are going to be talking about transfers. There has been another one, JP, um, just announced Ewan Henderson has signed for Hibs. Um, now, the big thing for this is just before we came on, you and I don't have the same view on, on Ewan Henderson, which is great because that's what debate's all about. He signed initially on loan. Um, however, they will be signing him full time, permanently, in the summer, uh, on a three-year deal. He's only 21. Uh, Maloney's obviously quite active at the moment in the, the transfer market. JP, what does this say about Henderson? I have said time and time again, I was a fan of Liam, I was a fan of Ewan. Ne- neither of their Celtic careers have come to fruition. What's your feeling on, on Ewan Henderson? I was just saying to you there before we uh, came on air that I just think he's, he's not really a fashionable quote unquote player in amongst the Celtic kind of mix. Like he doesn't really seem to have, um, to my knowledge anyway, doesn't seem to be a guy that's um, excited out with the Celtic first team and therefore come into the, the reckoning with um, a lot behind him. Somebody can easily correct me on that. I'm sure they maybe will, but um, it just seems like he's not come in with any fanfare and he's kind of probably going to leave without any fanfare mm-hmm. because it doesn't. I don't think if you were to do a straw poll with Celtic fans right now about whether or not they were that fussed about about um, Ewan Henderson going to Hibs, I don't know if there would be that many people that would be overly concerned. They would probably say it's a good move for him, um, kind of makes sense. Maloney's worked with him uh, when Maloney was at Celtic. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so you'll have had eyes on him and seen what he's about, you know, off the pitch as well. Um, which is obviously a massive factor when you're making a signing, especially when you're giving somebody a three-year deal. Um, and it's interesting that it's a loan within it. It's basically what we're doing with Maeda, isn't it? Mm, yeah, um, yeah. So provides... Like them. a compulsory purchase. Yeah, aye. So, I mean, I, 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 I'm i not an, at all surprised. There's been murmurs of, of Henderson going there. It might put to bed the Martin Boyle to Celtic rumour because you would think that there would have been maybe if there was deals being done between Hibs and Celtic, that that would have been linked in some like a way. Make weight. Or yeah. Perhaps, because, you know, there was, there was, there's been chat of Martin Boyle plus, uh, money plus Mikey Johnston for Martin Boyle or, or money plus Ewan Henderson for Martin Boyle. Um, the figure for Martin Boyle, I think, is fair. If it was three million, it does seem a lot for a 28-year-old player, but given recent, uh, recent departures from our division, uh, to to not be paying three million for Martin Boyle um, is that his actual transfer? Uh, I, 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 is that maybe, a fantasy? One? Maybe a fantasy. <laughs> maybe a fantasy. One, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I, I think you know when you look at the figures that are, are banded about, he is a proven you know SPFL player. You know who's scored goals uh, from a from a wide position, can play through the middle as well. We also what he did at Hamden. Um, not that you would go and sign someone based on a single performance like that. You would obviously like to think it would be a bit more balanced than just one game. But um, but yeah, back to you, uh, Liam Hewan Henderson. Even uh, I'm not I'm not uh, I, I, you know I, I like to see people going on and develop their careers. And if he's stagnating a bit at Celtic at 21, I guess 21 is the the, the type of age where you want to be playing regular first team football and, and yeah. now's that time. Definitely is. I'm going to have a look just where we're talking about him just to see how um, you know many games he actually played because he didn't play a great deal. Someone the other day, I think it was in yesterday's um, bulletin, uh, big shout out to the guys yesterday, it was a very enjoyable bulletin. They were talking about the fact that we see them on you know match days and, and for the fleeting appearances, JP, and I've always thought that Ewan Henderson looked, looked pretty good. I thought you know he comes in against Betis this season, scores a goal. He came in that night that we played Hazard, Sorrow uh, and Turnbull last season against Lille. And I thought he was probably the standout of all the guys and Sorrow and Turnbull seemed to kick on a wee bit, as did Hazard. Uh, Turnbull's the only guy now that would get a game in the team. He only made 11 appearances for Celtic. The loan deal out to Ross County didn't work out for Henderson. It was only 10 appearances he made. And of course, he spent some time at East End uh, making a further 10 appearances. At the age of 21, you really need to be looking at 31 appearances. That's substitute and starts Mm. as not being enough. Um, and you need to go away and get first team football. So I agree with you. It's a good move for Ewan Henderson. Whether or not he goes on to bigger and better things 
Um, I don't know. He's certainly working with uh, a very good up-and-coming coach with uh, regards to Sean Maloney. As you stated, they know each other. Um, Liam Henderson didn't do bad when he left Celtic, did he, really? I mean, he's doing well in, in Italy. No, I mean, uh, I'm as impressed with his ability to speak Italian as, um, as his, his footballing exploits. I mean, to, to go somewhere like that and learn the language and everything else is, is so so commendable because... You know, uh, I reckon probably a lot of transfers have, have not been successful with players going to, not that it's happened a lot, but with players going to a, a, another European uh, league and not embracing the culture and not, you know, trying to, you know, learn the language. Um, I think that would play a massive part in whether or not you're going to be a success there. But he's obviously, you know, <clears throat> I think being kind of earmarked by other Italian clubs to, you know, He's got a reputation now within the game in Italy, which is which is pretty amazing for a Scottish player. Mm. You know, and I think back to being a wee guy watching, you know, Serie A and Gazette Football Italia and stuff like that, and think how mental is it that he's actually there and playing in those stadiums. I mean, I've only ever been to the San Siro. I'd love to go to, you know, the other the other the sort of big stadiums like Napoli and you know uh, uh, what do you call it. Um, and tune in and stuff like that, you know, that he's actually, you know, getting to go to these places. I think it's a great advert for Scottish football. I mean, we've also got Aaron Hickey over there playing in, uh, for Bologna, but, you know, even further back than the Channel 4 coverage of Italian football, which I also loved, uh, you know, back in, and back at that time. Prior to that, Ian Rush goes to Juventus, mm. doesn't settle. Is kind of regarded as a flop. Has to come back to Liverpool, um, so it's a tough, it's a tough gig for any player uh, right, going over there. Respect to you in Russia, I don't I can't really imagine him speaking Italian. No, well, <laughs> actually, I remember um, th- there's a great quote about that, but I won't, I won't want to embarrass uh, Russia. By the way, I would I would recommend that you read his book. Very good autobiography. Um, last night, Rudy Vata's uh, wife who's on Twitter, who regularly tweets about Rocco, which is always a great thing because you, you're keeping up to tabs on his progression, revealed that Rudy Vata speaks seven languages. So wow. he's obviously one of these guys, JP, that wherever he went uh, from his homeland in Albania over to Celtic, played in France, and then he comes to Celtic, he goes, he spends time in Germany, he spent time in Japan. I saw that the other day, the yeah. Japan thing. He had, he had the Yokohama strip on. He that looked great. I don't think it was... The- was it the Marinos or were they, they called something different at the time? That It was definitely Yokohama, you know, and then something after that, but I don't know if it was Marinos. But I, and he's got, like, bleached blonde hair and he looks really 90s. He, he looks good. <laughs> the strips look great, though. Uh, These, you know, obscure kits. I remember when um, Gary Lineker signed for Nagoya Grampus 8. Oh, yeah. I remember it was Orange like this, and yellow. Ah, bizarre. Yeah. Is that on the retro sites? It should be. I, uh, I've, I've actually looked for that top and it costs a fortune. That's a cracker. To get, to get an original anyway, they're not cheap. Now, that has been a, an absolute seamless segue into Japanese football and Celtic's link with Japan <laughs> because that's the biggest talking point yeah. um, in terms of the transfer window. Talking of which, uh, Kelvin, our videographer, who I don't think has ever appeared on screen, but works away feverishly in the background, JP. Uh, Kelvin was in this morning and he and I were planning our transfer deadline day content. Mm -hmm. We're not doing it from the studio. Oh, We're not doing it from the studio. So watch this space. We're going to do something a wee bit different on transfer deadline day. We're going to be the sad guys waiting for nothing to happen (laughs) on transfer deadline day. But you know what? We'll have a bit of a laugh while we do it as well. Uh, We'll be talking about all the incomings, all the outgoings. But before we do that, let's have a wee chat about the three signings. You've not really had a chance to indulge in the three new signings. Um, and again, we're looking back on, you know, football in the 80s and 90s, which I was t- totally immersed in, not just Scottish football. And I keep saying to, to Tony, I used to love the pictures when um, Hulot, Van Basten and Weigard all went to um, AC Milan and, you know, the three countrymen going somewhere else. There's, I'm not comparing any of the players to the Japanese boys we brought in, but we have a contingent coming in now. Um, this is a man in Ange Postecoglou that knows that market so, so well. You were speaking about Boyle at £3 million. Why shouldn't Hibs ask for £3 million for Boyle? He's a star player. But when you can get the kind of value at the Japanese market, as we've undoubtedly got with these three guys, mm. then I would actually suggest that Ange is maybe looking further than, you know, the John Suter kind of link or, or the Martin Boyle link. What's your thoughts on that? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I got a text this morning from my pal saying it looks like John Suter's going to the other side of Glasgow, um, which is fair enough. You know, he's out of contract and <clears throat> whatever. Um, but with regards to the, the, the players that Ange Postacoglu has brought in, I mean, we've got glaring, you know, concrete evidence in our number eight of what <laughs> Ange Postacoglu, uh, you know, trusts in from that week. You know, I mean, it would be... You know, if there's anybody that's concerned, I mean, not, not that I've seen many, but if there's anybody concerned about the level of players that these guys are, then, I mean, you only need to point to, you know, a, a, a highlights reel of Kyogo Furashi in a Celtic shirt. You know, it's no longer... There is a highlights reel video to be made now of Furahashi in a Celtic shirt. No mm. longer one of these ones where you're watching it and going, oh, well, that's just his best bits from... You know exactly from the G. Someone compiled a Raphael video just like that, mate. Remember <laughs> that. Always remember that. Yeah, and we got we got hook line and sinker with that one. But uh, yeah, but the, the but the, the three guys that are coming in obviously cannot confess to have seen anything really of them in detail. Um, I have watched a couple of um, the 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 high, the aforementioned YouTube highlight reels. Um, I, I think and I hope that Maeda is going to be. Um, the damage. Is he the one that's exciting you? Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, he's the top scorer in the league. Um, I, you know, he just he, he was asked what he was going to bring, and he just said, "I, I bring um, pace and uh, strength and attack." And I, and I just thought, yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot of people can say and talk themselves up, but it does feel like he's got the tools and he's got the the, the sort of history, recent history, to back that up and. You know, that pattern about going to see the boss. I'm away to see the boss. I mean, that, I love that. <laughs> that's you know? brilliant. I, I really love that. And uh, that 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 kind of excites me as well. And it, it, I mean, thinking about how badly we were stretched in December, the squad was, you know, as much as Tom English or whoever else wants to slag about as having international players. And we mentioned this before. But they play Joey Dawson. I know. Uh, we mentioned No this disrespect before. to I, the guy. I know. But we mentioned this before about like, it's all very well having international players, but you know you're playing players out of position. Guys haven't played together before. Uh, you know, guys haven't played in certain stadiums before. You know, Ross County away on a, a Wednesday night, freezing cold. You know, you've not got a settled eleven going into that into that uh, game. So these guys coming in, are, um, thank God we're on the on the pulse and and, and got them in early. And the you know, well, two of them are are here in Hatate is I think nearly here. So, you know, it's good that they're here early, you know, bed them into the side and just bolster that squad that was, that was you know, falling apart at the seams as, as we were getting towards the end of December. And, of course, that's the reason why we asked for the winter break to be pulled forward, isn't it? I mean, like, <laughs> nothing to do with the fact that we wanted to have players, eh, sorry, fans back in the, in the ground, which may or may not be a thing based on that article that dropped late last night. I mean, I'm... Um, that's that's another that's another topic. It is. We will cover that before the end of the show, JP. You're spot on there because it's all about um, the actual content that's said by the individual, how it's reported, mm. and then the follow up. So we're all kind of left a wee bit in limbo. Um, I'm not yet building my hopes up that we'll be at the Hibs game when football resumes, but I am hope you know I really am hoping that is the case. When I, I look at the Maeda, what I like about it is um, we knew we needed a striker. Uh, at the beginning of the season, we're bringing Yakamakis. And, you know, it's a strange old curious tale of Yakamakis, eh? because we've we've not really seen enough of him to write him off. I wouldn't be prepared to write him off anyway at this stage. But he was the player that I felt was going to bring us the strength, the quality up top, maybe a bit of aerial prowess. Mm -hmm. He might still do it, JP. I can't possibly write him off um, after a penalty miss against Livingston because he's it's been stop start for him. In fact, it's been mainly stopped for him because of injuries. Mm -hmm. Um, But we've been talking all season about the deliveries that have been coming into that box. And yeah, fair enough. Kugo gets onto quite a few of them, but certainly not the ones that are aimed at his head. He, he's brilliant at getting in in front of a defender and, and slotting it away. A badder's pretty good at that as well, although you would expect him to be crossing many of them in. And we need, we, we lack a striker to get on the end of it. You know, the, the amount of balls that Jota has been playing in, we don't have that striker on the end of these. And, and I kind of thought, is Yakimakis that player? Prolific last season in the Dutch top division. Um, but it would appear that Maeda certainly is that type of player, isn't he? No, he definitely 100%. I mean, if you if you look at the way 
that he uh, absolutely tears it past defenders. And you can say what you like about the level that he's been playing at, but Kyogo Furuhashi was playing at that level as well and was doing similar things uh, to him. And I think quite a few people have expressed surprise at the fact that Maeda didn't come first and Furuhashi came first. And then mm. I read somewhere someone saying that it was maybe a gentleman's agreement with Postacoglu and Yokohama not to to pinch their player halfway through the season. Um, that would make sense. Rather than you know, and, and leave it till, uh, uh, <clears throat> till the end of the season. So mm. I, I, I get that. I also read uh, or heard Dan Orlowitz saying that this was kind of a bit of a robbery of sorts, you know, Celtic pain, whatever the figures are, I'm not entirely sure. I've read 2 million, 2 million and 1 million euros. Well, I mean that. All in. I mean, if you if you think, if you've, if you can, if they are at a, a similar level, or even maybe a couple of notches down from Furuhashi, if that is the case, the amount of that versus the amount of money that we've squandered on players over the over. I mean, you go back to somebody like Nadir Chifji, like one and a half. In the news this week again, yeah, signing for St Johnston. I mean, Nadir Chifji, Nadir Chifji has proven beyond his Celtic career. There is a that that is a level like he hasn't gone on and done wondrous things since he's left Celtic mm-hmm. and justified us paying that money for him. I didn't want that guy at Celtic from the moment that he was linked. I just I said to everybody around about me at Celtic Park, I was like, "This is a waste of time. That guy's not going to do anything for Celtic. He's not going to be a first team player. He's not going." And folk were like, "I'll give him a chance and all this sort of stuff." And I was like, "It was the biting thing. Remember, he bit somebody and all that." And I just I, I, and he, he he went on to hook. Emilio at training. Oh, I didn't know Remember that. Remember, he burst his ear. Oh, really? At training, yes. I, I heard. That, I heard. I think it was on the uh, uh, open goal with Simon, an early open goal with Simon Ferry, where he spoke about um, him going all the way down to London to buy a pair of Louboutin trainers, and then I think he spent like fifteen hundred or tw- two grand on a pair of trainers just because he suddenly had all this money because he was at Celtic and you know money coming out of his ears, and then. He bought the trainers and then was walking about and then immediately got the guilt about having such expensive trainers. So took them back and then got and instead of getting his money back, they just gave him a credit note for the shop. And uh, and then they were all slagging him in the dressing room apparently. So but <sighs> I mean, me. but I mean you go back to him and then there's been so many other players that we've brought in that haven't, you know, anywhere near Tens of millions filled, filled the shop. Tens of millions of pounds. And and and, and so whatever it is we spent on these guys. Uh, I, I honestly trust Ange Postacoglu so much with, you know, I trust him with, you know, my mortgage <laughs> because I, I just think he's, he's 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 savvy about, I don't think, I think he knows that any bad signings will reflect badly on him and I don't mm. think he wants to let the club or let the, the fans down and he, he must get such a buzz from seeing what Kyogo Furashi is doing because he's responsible for him being at the club, you know, it's him. He's the reason he's here. I mean, it must have been the same for Janssen and Larson. Even when Janssen left Celtic to then watch what Larson did after he left, must have filled him with an awful lot of uh, pride. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, see, when when you're talking about Janssen, Janssen again, <clears throat> um, as well as Postacoglu, of course, managed in Japan. There's another J- Japanese link there. Uh, we went on to sign uh, Nakamura and Mizuno. And, of course, we've complimented our Japanese buys with another four this season. Out of all the links, the only one that didn't really crack on so far was Mizuno. Mm. Um, So, you know, that's a market that's worked really well for us. When we're talking about all these strikers that were brought in for several millions, you know, going into tens of millions, JP, um, it's frightening to think how many guys have come in. Um, I think the only one that's gone on and done okay is probably Pukki. I can't yeah. think of a player that's gone on and you thought, well, i never seen that at Celtic. Yeah. You know, Klamala's done okay, I guess. But, you know, the, the whole list of them from Bangura, um, even some of the loan deals, Brozek comes in. Remember Powell Brozek coming Berget. in? And, uh, all these guys, Berget under Ronnie Dyer. Now, last, last word on Chifchi. We give him the number seven jersey. Oh, I mean that you know? as well. Eh? Yeah. Who else has had that? Lundberg? Janino. Janino. Oh. So we give him the number seven jersey. Um, he scores the first goal in uh, Brendan Rodgers' tenure at Celtic. That's a good start. Albion Ayeti scores the first goal in Postacoglu's tenure at Celtic. Yeah. yeah? 
<laughs> and they didn't, they didn't crack on after that. I'll be in a, kind of at this point in time, you can probably add I'll be in a Yeti to that uh, list as well. Well, and, and when you look at the fees, probably one of the worst, five million. Yeah. You know, if you think about that, because a lot of the other guys are two and a half, you know, bio Rasmussen. Yeah. All these kind of players, two and a half, three million quid. Mm -hmm. And then you come to a Yeti, I mean, in terms of wages plus the transfer fee, massive, massive loss. I know. If, if we are able to offload, and we're asking the question, who should, who else should be offloaded? If we're able to offload a Yeti, and I know the discussion was, was had yesterday, and I think we can. I mean, there's there's teams out there that need a striker, right? Um, and people say, yeah, but the wages, etc. Obviously, with a loan deal, mm. you can cut a deal. You, I mean, the, the rule is, as long as the team that's that's paying parties' wages is paying at least one pound, you can cut a deal. Mm. I mean, a lot of the, the players that go to teams like Dunfermline from clubs like Celtic and Rangers, or they go to Clyde mm. on loan. Clyde, even a 17 or 18-year-old at Celtic, um, the, the wage structure that Celtic have, Clyde can't afford their weekly wages. No. So there's a, there's a deal, and that can be done. So we will be able to offload players like a Yeti, but if we do... It will be very similar to what's happened with Henderson. It will be a loan deal, yeah, probably with a promise to buy or an option to buy, yeah, uh, on a Yeti. And I think that we probably could offload him if he was to go back to Switzerland. Similarly with Barkas, I reckon there's clubs in Greece who'd be interested in Barkas. He's got stock over there. I, I still am kind of bewildered as to um, about the, the sort of thought the thought process with regards to Barkas and this sort of comedic. Uh, you know, tag that seems to have been uh, put on him by, you know, you, you see, uh, there was that tweet that went around when he started against St. Johnson saying, um, no surprise that Barkas didn't catch COVID, you know, you can't get, well, as if to say you can't catch anyone else. And it's just like, and then Brian calling him hologram hands yesterday. And it's just like, whoa, like, it's such a small sample size. I, I, I haven't seen enough of Barkas to be labeling them either, you know, terrible or great. You know, he's he's just in between for me. He's just he's just a keeper that's played for Celtic. He's not. I don't think he's been an unmitigated disaster. He's been an unmitigated disaster in, in the sense that we paid five million for him, and he's not been. He's not. You know, uh, nailed down a first team place. But last season was insane like, for all, um, all manner of reasons. Mm. Um, and I don't. I I wouldn't be. You know, overly concerned if Barkas was the backup. Um, Along with Bain until the end of the season, and then if you know if in, in the summer if, if somebody was to come in from him, fine because he's clearly not settled. But I, I, like I said, I don't think it. I don't think he's as bad as as he's been made out to be. You know, he's not. I've seen worse keepers at Celtic than Barkas. I have, and, and see the other thing about uh, the goalkeeper situation: who should be offloaded? I think that's a situation where we need to to do something in that department. We've got a number one, a stick on number oh, one in Joe Hart, yeah. right? And then you're looking at, right, so who's his backup? The amount of goalkeepers we've got, we've got Ross du Duhan out on loan to Tranmere Rovers. You've got Toby Iwilemi, um, who is an England under 19. Um, I don't know if he's got a cap yet. He's certainly been in the squad. And he's a guy that is well thought of. Uh, Kennedy was talking about him, as was Darno Day last season. You've then got Connor Hazard, who comes in, um, for that game against Leo, as did Ewan Henderson, who we started off the show speaking about. And, you know, up and down. But again, it was a season like no other. Uh, JP, he'll be remembered for saving penalties in the cup final, but a lot of Celtic fans don't rate him. After that particular performance, he gets handed a new four-year deal mm. and never been seen since, really. He's a Northern Irish internationalist. Um, but again, he's at that age where he needs first-team football. He's 22, as is Duhan. Um, and then don't forget, you've got Barkas and Bain. So you've got five goalkeepers there. And a club like Celtic don't need five goalkeepers. We really don't, particularly when you look at the fact that uh, the B team, right? So you've, you're going to have players in the B team that you don't expect to be making the step up this season. I wouldn't have expected Joey Dawson to make the step up. Anything is, <laughs> anything is possible. Um, but you, you, need, you need a couple of guys, maybe, and then you can dip into your underage players if, if necessary for, for B-team level. But first first picks, first team players, Joe Hart, Hazard, Bain and Toby have all been on um, the starting lineup or on the bench. Mm. Uh, for me, that's top heavy. And I think that the likes of Duhan and Hazard... You've got to get these guys game time. You've got to get them out the door. And in Barkas's case, I think we will be trying to push them out. Um, and that's a, that's a situation, that's a position that I still think that we might run with Bain as our backup, but I wouldn't be 100% happy if there's a suspension or an injury mm. to Joe Hart 
in the second half of the season. Remember, Ange thought he could get a game out of Barkas. We started the season off with Barkas and goals, um, and it just didn't happen. Rio Atati seems to be that utility player that's come in. He can cover a number of different positions, um, and although he has played left back, I don't think that I'll be saying, well, that's a left-back situation sorted out. I think he's filled in at left-back mm-hmm. uh, previously rather than that being his best position. Um, there is a versatility there, and I think that if you can bring in a, a player that can play three or four different positions, when you're looking at the squad issues that we've had, that's a brilliant signing. And and when you look at the, what is it, one million euros, two million euros for Hatati? Yeah, I mean, I mean, whenever I think of utility player, if you're of a certain age like me, and you, uh, <laughs> championship manager, probably what ninety eight, ninety nine. Rory De Lapp was the utility player. He Mate, my championship player. manager days were ninety two, ninety three. Oh, come, come on, on no, that's before the the real player names were I on think the game. I was still Nintendo at that point before I progressed the uh, PC or whatever. But no, but Rory De Lapp was like the ultimate utility player. I could play like defensive midfielder, right, left, centre, if, if that if that is correct, I might be wrong, but he definitely could pay, play about four positions on champ man. And, um, you know, it's it's, it's not had... I don't, it's been a while since we've actually signed somebody who's been labelled that. Because if you saw the, the, the sort of uh, poster profiles for the players, it was Rio Hitati, utility player. Mm-hmm. And he was labelled... Like, you know, that was the Celtic official account, I think. And then the rest of them were like midfielder... Uh, uh, Adeguchi midfielder, Maeda striker. So, I mean, let's face it, uh, quite a lot of the players so far have been utility players this season. If you actually look at some of the teams we've put out, Juranovic, mm-hmm. utility player. Left, right, <laughs> back, as well as, as right uh, wing back. Ralston. Tony Ralston, <laughs> Liam Scales. Aye. Um, he's played a few positions. He's not played his preferred position yet, which is centre half. Yeah. Is that right? Is that, is that, is that actually... Is... Well, we put up a clip on the YouTube channel. I'll come back to the clips in a wee while, where Liam Scales oh, then... talks about his preferred position and he, he prefers to play centre-half. Mm-hmm. But as he said, he, he played left-back and left-wing-back for Shamrock Rovers. Mm. So I just think that the, the situation that Ange has faced all season, bringing in a, util- a, a utility player is music to his ears mm-hmm. uh, from a selection perspective. There's been some games where you've looked at that team particularly against St. Johnson, where you're thinking, wow, we started the season off with one right back, JP. Mm. One person who could play right back. Yeah, you could have played maybe Stephen Welsh in there. You probably could have played Uzazi Uruguide. Mm-hmm. Don't think he was ready to be playing right back. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, of course, he has played one game since then. But Hatati, I think, he just he ticks a lot of boxes, to use a, a, a cliche. But before we move on to the third Japanese signing, uh, what I found pretty funny about Maeda was you had Paul Cuddy here on the Celtic website crafting these brilliant uh, questions, you know, opening up. And the question was really in-depth and thorough. And he was being faced with answers like, yes, yes. <laughs> Loved it. Yeah, <laughs> an, in- it <laughs> <laughs> an interview is nightmare, but Paul did well. Um, Ida Gucci uh, is the third signing coming in, and he was described by our, our pal in Japan, Dan, low risk, high reward, almost like you, you can't fail because it's a you know a low transfer fee. Mm-hmm. Um, he's coming. He's taken in Cham's squad number. He's twenty five years of age. He's a player who has got European football experience. Mm-hmm. And he's had a, a move to Leeds that didn't work out uh, as well. So, you know, there's maybe something in the back of his mind thinking, I want to give British football another crack. Didn't work out for him. Um, and I think that he's a type of player, having looked at the footage and, and read everything that, that's been put out by the experts, I'm certainly not a Japanese football expert, he's a type of player that I thought Soro was. Mm-hmm. So does this open the door for perhaps Soro to move well, as well. You'd think so. I mean, I, just thinking back to the, Liam, uh, the Ewan Henderson thing and him coming in against Leo and then not really getting a sniff after that, but Turnbull and Soro did. Mm. But we paid transfer fees for Turnbull and so- Soro, so it's almost like they had to be justified, those, those guys. Whereas th- perhaps the fact that he was an academy graduate and in that position has maybe... You know, gone against them in a sense because we've paid transfer fees for guys in that same position, and therefore, the you know the the manager uh, at the time would have felt that he had to play them, or maybe there was influence to play them. I have no idea. I'm just that speculation on my part. But um, but um, but sorrow. I mean, I think I, I think I, I I don't think that he has a future at Celtic as as a first team mm. player. 
that's not any slight against him. I'm sure he could play at another club at a different level, perhaps. But I just I don't think that he is going to be a revelation in the same sense that you know a Ralston is or the rejuvenation of Tom Rogic or anything like that. I, I I can't see a redemption for him at some point down the line, and certainly not this season anyway, because it's too it's far too uh, tight um, and important this season to be playing anybody that is a bit of a risk. So Edigucci coming in again, you know, the manager knows him. And I know that there's been a lot made about the fact that we're bringing in three Japanese players and we already have a, a fourth in Kyogo Furahashi. But if you look back at the last few years, we've had numerous French players yeah. <laughs> all at the same time. And there's been that kind of French clique that some people, you know, obviously we all loved it because most of them contributed very well. But there was also maybe the idea that there was they, they kind of lived in their own wee world away from the rest, and that's never healthy in a dressing room. I mean, that's going to happen naturally with these Japanese players because they all, they all speak the same language. Mm. But I don't see you. You can see how Kyogo Furahashi has been integrated into the into the squad and the team, and how much everybody loves him and everything else. So you know that's not been an issue for him, um, and and I certainly don't have an issue with. You know, having four players from a league that I don't know that well. I mean, I'm I'm just looking at it as in in terms of I'm trusting the manager's judgment on them as, as footballers. So, um, Edigechi coming in, yes, he might not have maybe the same uh, hype about him as the other ones do, but he's he's still somebody that the manager's hanging his hat on, and therefore I'll I'll you know look forward to seeing. I'm looking forward to seeing them all, and I really hope. We're seeing them all in the flesh and not on a on a stream. Yeah, absolutely. JP, you're talking there about how you want to bring a kind of support network in for players. Although I'm not saying Kyogo seemed isolated because he hasn't seemed isolated. To have um, other people coming in from Japan, I, I, I guess, would be quite comforting in terms of mm. off the park, off the field, and it might help him in that respect. It can work both ways. Like you say, there was talk of some kind of unrest or, or cliques uh, developing last season. Um, but think back to Janssen's time. We've spoke about Janssen a couple of times uh, over the last few days. You know, that's a big Scandinavian influence, you know, and, and that worked in the favour um, of the of the team as well. It, it doesn't, I mean, a clique doesn't have to be uh, for the detriment. It could be such a, a, a clique that it supports the guys within that and it helps their performances. Big shout out to everybody who is liking us on Facebook. Doesn't get enough shout outs. So thank you for liking us. Um, and we are being liked by Butterbean Lundy and Michael Voslot, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for that. Uh, Yvonne Henderson sends her love and we're getting blown kisses by Jordan Byrne on Facebook as well. Lovely, lovely to see. Um, how will it affect Kyogo then? I mean, in terms of his performances, can he even get better? I don't. I, I think we're seeing a player here um, who appears to be at the peak of his powers anyway. And this is someone who's had a bit of a stop start with, with injuries this season as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, he. I don't really know what his relationship is. I did have a look to see who followed who. Uh, that's a bit kind of. It's a bit kind of uh, okay, boomer of me or twenty twenty one. Check to see who follows who, and uh, they don't all follow each other. They maybe will now by now, but um, I haven't done a few days ago. They didn't. I think Maeda followed Kyogo Furahashi, but the other two didn't. Um, so maybe they, there is relationships there already. Do you follow Kyogo? I don't know, but you love him, I, so I do, you I, know. Uh, uh, but I, I, but you know, I, I'm thinking more in terms of whether they actually know each other, like off the park. Yeah. Um, I mean, even if they don't, I mean, they're definitely going to have. I mean, Kyogo Furuhashi has been here what six months, and will be able to, you know, show them about and you know help them integrate into Celtic, which is quite mad considering that he's probably still finding his feet. Yeah. Uh, in the city and in the club. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've saw, I've saw pictures on Twitter of of Maeda being in like a in a like a Best Buy or something like that, getting a bottle <laughs> a bottle of juice for a, a bottle of ginger. Aye. Yeah, but I mean, like, I can only imagine how surreal that must be for him to you know some you know mad Celtic fan to come up and be like, all right, all right, man, yeah, get a picture. Of it. I mean, maybe he's used to that in uh, in Japan. Maybe they get left alone. I don't know, but um, but he's certainly going to have to get used to it here because he's quite. Uh, he's quite easily identified, isn't he? I mean, there's not going to be too many guys 
went about looking like him. I wouldn't have thought. Um, so he's 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 going. <laughs> he'll need to get used to it fast. I like the pictures that people are comparing him and uh, a modern day Larson and saying uh, there, yeah. there's a wee uh, oh with the glasses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, uh, interesting point. Before we move on for that though, JP, you're talking about the social media platforms that would show that you maybe know the person. My best mate doesn't follow me on Twitter mm-hmm. because Twitter's not that type of place, is it? Yeah. So what one would be the platform where you would follow someone? Is it Facebook? I is it Instagram? Know, I'd say probably Facebook. I'm not even in Instagram. But, but then Facebook's apparently dead. So, I mean... Is it? And then and another another mate of mine said that, that because it's meta, they'll, now, they'll just... Everything will all die and it'll become one thing. And uh, the, the same friend, by the way, was trying to get me to buy... Uh, what was it? Uh NFTs, non fungible tokens. You've never even heard of that, have you? No. Right. Well, that is a whole different world. It's where you basically divide up uh, a piece of art and then you buy a piece of that art as a non fungible token. It's mental. It's absolutely what? mental. I, uh, you're putting me in mind to build Drummond. Hi, I know. I know. I, 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 I'm a, not, by the way, I'm not peddling this. This you, is just something that's been He bought a piece of art for £25,000. Uh huh. And he cut it into twenty five thousand pieces Aye, and started selling it for a pound a piece. That's that digitally. That's what an NFT is. It took me a while to get my head around it, but my friend uh, Nathan uh, was drilling it into me and saying, "If you've got any spare money at all right now, put it in NFTs." And he was like, "Trust me, trust me, Jack. Twenty years <laughs> time, you'll thank me." And I was like, "Is this like a Back to the Future thing where you've got like you've got a sports almanac or something, and you're telling me to like bet on?" you know, the Yankees to win whatever. And I'm just like, uh, Wow, interesting. So they're not physically cutting up the artwork like no. Bill Drummond did. No. Um, got to thank everybody for tuning in. Matt McIver, good afternoon from Northampton at this point. This is where people just make up random locations. I'm not saying you are, Matt, and just say, you know, I'm watching you in X, Y, and Z all around the world. But if you are watching um, in a far-flung place, let us know because it's always interesting to engage with our audience all over the world. We have seen a big up surging Australian viewers and Japanese viewers, which takes me on to the next point. We are buying players from that market because of their ability. Absolutely. There has been occasions in the past where it, there's been a marketing um, kind of proxy, if you like. By proxy, there's been a big market. There's going to be a huge interest in Celtic over in Japan at this moment in time. Dan, again, to name drop him, he is an expert in Japanese football, he spoke about that. You know, we were the biggest European club in Japan back in Nakamura's time. Mm -hmm. We've never been anywhere near that since for obvious reasons, Mm -hmm. but now we are verging back into uh, focus in terms of the Japanese market. Is that a big thing for Celtic? Uh, Potentially, yeah. I know uh, uh, (laughs) Stephen from uh, 20 Minute Tims is is always uh, quite (laughs) uh, amused at this idea that, you know, Japanese players equal shirt sales, you know, as if it's like a kind of, you know, a given that, that we're yep. going to sell loads of shirts in Japan. And, and obviously that um, is a bit of a kind of uh, easy um, conclusion to come to. But I, I, I think more of the impact is going to be, if we're going to have any, is more kind of just online interest. You know, it, it, you know, I know there's been pointed to the fact that the Celtic Japan account has something like 39,000 followers mm. um that's great but i mean i don't really know how that translates in terms of you know because you don't know how many of them of those people are actually based in japan it could just be celtic fans around the world that have just decided to follow that account yeah um if there's data that shows that it is in japan then that's a different story um i think just the interest in in, in the games and profile being raised you know things like seeing like you know, digital billboards in Tokyo of mm. Hashi and things like that in a Celtic strip. I mean, yeah. that, if you can, if you're going to question the impact of that, then and, and then, then I would I would take I would maybe take issue with that because that's clearly going to have some sort of impact on you know sports fans in Japan if they're seeing you know uh, footage. And, you know, I mean, Furuhashi's goal in the cup final. If that's shared in Japan, that's that's quite a and and, and a and a sold out. Stadium, 50,000 national stadium. Folk can say what they want about Scottish football, but he scored two goals on the biggest stage currently offered to him um, in our domestic game and won the game. So, I mean, that story as a narrative in itself in Japan surely appeals to a substantial amount of their Mm. very large population. 
and and also Laura made a great point that it, it took us back to the uh, Italian football in the 1990s because you had that smoke as the backdrop. Oh, it was when, amazing. You know, yeah. so the whole thing looked absolutely iconic when Kyogo scores those goals, and that's been beamed all over the world. Yeah, that's currently my kind of uh, fuel to get me through this time of not having football you know where like, I, I'm, I I just go back to that and watch the videos that I took on my phone and and just sort of remember how great I mean it's so surreal to think that that was only a few weeks ago mm-hmm. and yet now we're, we're down to I know that obviously we're in the shutdown at the moment but prior to that for that one St Johnston game we were down to 500 fans at a game so you go from that extreme and that absolute high of having you know the cup final and everything that it entailed to you know, watching it on your phone um, was just uh, that. I mean, I, I still can't quite get my head around that. So, but yeah, the, the, the atmosphere at the, 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 the League Cup final was unreal. You know, like that, that the and the backdrop, like you say, and Laura said, it was uh, it was really special. I know there's been some great images uh, over the last few years, and that is up there. That is one of the finest. Uh, on the subject of social media platform Stevie Kenny comes in and says he's never out of Facebook jail thankfully I've never been thrown in Facebook jail yet um, and Studs Lanigan what a name Twitter is absolutely mental red anything goes well let's remember that it is real life people think that you know you can say and do what you want on social media it's not the case people are affected negatively by what is said and done on social media so let's just Keep it nice. Keep it civil, JP, you know. Um, But on that point, I'm always looking at social media and platforms and YouTube and everything else that we do. Um, And I was thinking, you know, one thing I'm a wee bit behind the times with, but I'm going to admit it, right? I I don't get TikTok yet. Um, Someone someone within the studio will set up an Axom TikTok page at some point. I'm not sure what the Never content will entail. to contribute to that in <laughs> any way because I, I will refuse point blank. I, say, I, I have certain lines that I need to draw and being involved in TikTok is, yeah. is not one of them. Well, th- this is the thing because there are so many and we invest a lot of our time on the YouTube channel, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but obviously we've got Twitch, we've got Instagram pages out there and hopefully we'll have someone else within the studio very soon who will be able to focus a wee bit more time on that. But on the YouTube point, for the last oh year and a half now, uh, we have been focusing massively on the YouTube channel because that's where the content is going to be. We do have a website, we do have a blog, but we've not been focusing on written content, even though that's the kind of basis of my whole Celtic content creation, JP, writing books. Uh, it's all at the moment to do with interaction, video footage. So we've got the, the live streams, which the bulletin is of one hour a day. Uh, we've got other shows that, that utilise that, but we're also creating new content all the time. That new content will be you know, in-depth interviews with Celtic figures. It's going to be little features. We're actually working on a couple of different documentaries that will be released at some point this year. But everything we've done up until now has been, yeah, labour-intensive in terms of production and editing, but long form, 30 minutes to an hour. Saturday's bulletin was two hours long. So big chunks of content gone on the channel. And what we need to do is we need to have short content and mid content. So we're working on that as well. So talking of which, there's been a few comments on the YouTube channel recently about the clips section of the channel. Just to let you know, no, it's not a shameless cash-in because you don't make a lot of ad revenue from very, very short clips. So it's nothing to do with that. We're putting our toe in the water, JP, because there will be other Um, uses for clips and shorts and all that kind of stuff moving forward so watch this space we are learning as we go on that channel if you haven't done so already get subscribing we've got some massive names lined up for interviews and I mean massive GPU know who I'm talking about Um, and documentaries we're actually producing documentaries and we'll be putting them on the YouTube channel Celtic related so loads of big content. That's why there's a massive push on the YouTube channel because we want as many eyes on there as we possibly can. These documentaries will probably take us the best part of the year to make. We want as many people to watch them as possible. That is the key to it. So get on the, the YouTube channel and subscribe, get involved in the community aspect of it. These clips that we're putting up, loads of comments. So there's a whole interactive element of it as well, JP. And also we attended um, in person or remotely all those press conferences, we then edited all that content. We're now archiving it on our channel. So watch this space for far more content. I want to talk about strikers because we've mentioned the likes of 
a Yeti. We expect him to be out the door. I think Poster Coglu has been very fair with Albion a Yeti. He's given him opportunities and it doesn't look as though it's going to work out for him. So we'll wish him well and he can move on. And you can see how a change can benefit a player. Shane Duffy is a great example of that, JP. Um, we've got Yakamakis, who we a question mark. We don't know what's going to happen with him. We don't know how effective he's going to be really in the second half of the season. I know. Uh, the, the list that we've reeled off, I really yeah. hope he's not another one of them because... I mean, you just you just want that to be a thing of the past, you know? Like I know. But we'll see. Th- this is the thing. There's always going to be, at a club like Celtic, a lot of ins and outs. There's always going to be players that it does not work out for, you know? And some of them go on and play well elsewhere, like Shane Duffy, like Timo Pukki, right? They've done well since they've left Celtic. Tony Watt, eventually. Mm-hmm. He's done well since he's left. But there's a huge amount of transfers, like you're saying, you just don't want Yakamakis to be one of them. So that leaves us with uh, Maeda and we've got Kyogo who, and we've got Abada who can play through the middle. But there has been rumblings over the last few days that Lee Griffiths is going to be punted back from Dundee mm. and his uh, loan deal is going to be cut short. So two options, if you ask me, you cut his deal short, which costs you money, but we've done it with Encham this season, mm. or we immediately get him loaned back out until the end of his, his contract. Would you agree with that? What a, what a curious tale that is. You know, when you listen to how he spoke when he first left Celtic to go to Dundee, it was it all seemed to be as if it was Celtic's fault. Mm-hmm. You know, and, mm-hmm. you know, it was all about, well, all I need is minutes and all I need is this, that, and the next thing. And it's like, well, your goal, I, I think I said at the time, we will see in six months or a year what Lee Griffiths is worth to the game in Scotland. And right now, off the back of the first half of the season, for whatever reason, whether it's fitness or whatever, he hasn't, you know, returned the sort of goals that, you know, you would expect. If you're just talking about him as a footballer, he's not returned what you would expect. I I, I mean, I know Dundee aren't exactly a world beating side no disrespect but I mean I expected them to you know still return more than what two goals yeah <laughs> I mean that's, that's and when you score one and it's an absolute belter ah. that's got Lee Griffiths written all over it and you run away giving it all this you <sighs> think mate two goals I know two goals you've scored so that's it's bad. not about trying to shut people up go and do what we know you could do as a footballer and it's, it's in a time where we bemoan the dearth of attacking talent coming through in Scottish football mm. we speak about it all the time on this podcast when was the last goal scoring striker Celtic produced years ago decades ago um, and a lot can be said about that because it's across the board JP you know and there you've got Lee Griffiths and he's just fallen into this category a different category entirely of what might have been I mean Tony Stokes hasn't even got a club O'Connor probably was it's out nice the game watch, though. <laughs> yeah is he <laughs> is that social media Aye, as well showing off a 10 grand Rolex or something like that the other day. <sighs> I'd rather see a goal Aye. I'd rather see him scoring a goal I know, I know. but uh, I mean Lee Griffiths is 31 he scored something like 100 and it was like 123 or 133 goals for Celtic somewhere in that ballpark so he was on his way to 200 before all the nonsense you know the the controversy this started you know. with when Brendan was in charge I know that's how long ago this has been going on yeah I mean they've all told him to pull his socks up and 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 just play the game <laughs> play like play the game on the pitch and off the pitch act like a professional and be a professional and I, it's it is sad to see because you know he out of all of those guys that you know your Jason Cummings your Derek Ryerton your Gary O'Connors your Anthony Stokes the, he's the best of them all like w- without a shadow of a doubt I know people still go on about how great a finisher Ryerton was but he didn't do it consistently over a period of time and he hasn't written himself into the history books really at any club Lee Griffiths has whether people like him or not he has scored more than 100 goals for Celtic and put himself in a He's in, a, he's in a club there. He's yeah. in a club, you know, and, and that, that's, you know, something that you can't take away from him. But at 31, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be the end for him. But. See, the, the, the other guys you've mentioned, um, and I think Cummins is getting into that category, they've lost four or five years of their career. Mm-hmm. Uh, either at the end of the career, like O'Connor and Riordan, just tapered off, or during a period where there was still time to save it, and I, Griffiths is in that category. If there was a manager out there who was, you know, 
brilliant at this kind of man management where they can turn people around, not just in the football park, but in life. Look at the talent they could have at their disposal. But I've got to say, I can't see it. I think you're at an age where you're all the man you're ever going to be, JP. You're never going to change your ways. You're never going to unlearn the mistakes that you continually make. No, I mean, and I know that those guys, or, you know, if they were, I know they probably, they definitely won't be listening or watching us, but if they were, Lee Griffiths has popped in from time to time oh, really? on a Twitter stream. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if they were listening or watching us, they would be like, well, how many games of football have you played? And, you know, what's in your bank balance and all the rest of it? And that's that's all very well and good. But we're football fans. We look at what we see on the pitch. We're on the other side of the fence. And, you know, we, we see what we can see when someone isn't fulfilling their potential. There's and nothing worse. It's so frustrating because no. you're just like, my God, if I had that opportunity... <laughs> And then people will say, oh, well, if you had the opportunity, you would be susceptible to the, you know, um, the, the sort of trappings of success and all the rest of it. And, you know, you're, you're, you'd sort of get carried away with, with the money and everything else. And and, and maybe that's true, but I just, I just think it's, uh, it, like you say, it's so frustrating to see mm-hmm. talent, you know, not being fulfilled. And particularly when they're wearing, you know, Gary O'Connor has never worn a Celtic shirt. Um, but rather than Stokes and Griffiths have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've seen them, you know, do the business. And when you, whenever you see someone do the business and you see them doing it over a course of a season, you think, right, well, that can happen again. And it's never really happened again for Griffiths for a long, long time. You yeah, know? It's, it's four or five years now, mm-hmm. you know. And as you say, when he was... Um, those, two, those two free kicks against England. Two free kicks against Unreal. England. 40 goals in a season, we know, but he could have been. Um, interesting, this is a great point, actually. And this comes in from HR Puff and Stuff. The names just keep getting better. Jackie Mack, fullback, winger, midfield, a utility player, yeah, yeah. one of my all time favourites. Yeah, he was. Eh? He's a funny guy. He's very good at impressions as well. Is he? Yes. I've not read his book yet. I need to get into that. I know Laura has read his book and speaks very highly of it as well. So let's talk about another couple of players then that's, who are already in the building, JP. Jota and Cameron Carter Vickers. There is talk that. Uh, we're going to, you know, push the boat out, make the deals permanent. Um, it would probably cost us in the region of ten to twelve million pound. That's a big outlay, but you know, I'm not thinking Barkas, Ayete, Rasmussen. When I talk about these two guys, I think it's a no-brainer at that at that price. Get them in, get them signed. Yeah, I mean the 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 outlay. I mean, is it, it does seem a bit much considering we haven't um, spent that level of money on players for a while, but then. We we've we've needed to spend that level of money for on players for, mm. for for a while, and when you're talking six million each, you're going back to Chris Sutton twenty years ago yeah. to 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 a point where we spent six million, and and you know football has moved on massively. Transfer fees are insane. Players are going for ten to twelve million, and they've only made like what twenty five thirty starts, and and can't even nail a first team place at a club, and um, so. To pay six million for a guy who is at a good age, has proved he can do it at the centre half, um, and looks really composed and commanding, um, and there's a potential for sale on there as well because he's still at that age where you know if he was to do well for us for a couple of years, including say in Europe, then there's no reason why he couldn't get a move a la Virgil Van Dijk. I'm not, I'm not saying that he's in the same league as Virgil Van Dijk, by the way. I, I'm just using that as an example for a centre half going to the Premier League or going back to the Premier League, should I say? And Jota, everybody has been wowed by him. And had he had more game time between the point where he was injured and now, um, he would probably be in a lot more people's thinking for, you know, um, half season play of the year or whatever. I think Kyogo's obviously you know, taking that um, mantle, um, probably followed closely by Joe Hart um, for, for his impact. Mm-hmm. But Jota has, has been a sensation, you know. I mean, his, his numbers are unbelievable. He's two-footed. He's a, he's a showman. He's got end product. You know, he clearly loves being at Celtic. I think, I mean, from everything he's given us so far in, in social media and, and media interviews and stuff like that. So um, I, I I would, you know, if if it, does, if it doesn't happen for whatever reason, I, I wouldn't then be like, you know, going crazy at Celtic or Michael Nicholson or anything like that. Because, you know, ultimately, if the deal's willing to be done on both sides, then it'll happen. Mm-hmm. You know, There's no question of that. But 
you know, it might, it might ultimately come down to the player whether or not he's settled in Glasgow, both of them. So, but the, the noises that you hear from them, I know every, everybody always l- l- likes to uh, home in on what they hear from a player and, and make it positive. And, and it, may, it may just be them talking, you know, sort of nonsense or whatever. But I, I think uh, I think from what I've heard from them, they, they, they would um, be up for staying. And unless anybody comes in from left field and, and swoops them away from us, you know, a bigger club or, a, or in a bigger league, then you know maybe we might we might actually get away with it and mm. and sign them. And and again, they fall into that category, JP, of of the model that we've used so many times uh, in the last fifteen twenty years, where you know if they were to perform well for Celtic, we get into the Champions League, we put them on a higher platform. There is a massive sell on potential for both players. I would suggest as well. I mean, uh, Jota coming over here, and really, I think. Well, we point to proof. Um, you know, he's not had the, the game time he probably would like uh, over in, in Benfica. If you look at his age, uh, you'd think he would have more appearances. He's had a few loan deals. Uh, and when you look at uh, Carter Vickers, who I agree with you, he's been, I'm not going to say an unsung hero, but he's kind of gone under the radar because he's not that offensive player. He's not the entertaining style player. But in terms of his importance coming in and just stapling down that centre-half position, regardless of who he's playing with, it could be Stevie Welsh, it could be near beat on, it could be Starfelt. He covered Starfelt in the final as well. There was mm-hmm. that, somebody shared a picture online of the two of them holding the trophy and it said, um, you know, when your mate is having a, a bad day, you, you, you help him out or whatever. And, you know, he did. You know, he, he did definitely pick up, you know, after... Starfield did look a bit shaky in the final at a couple of points. Yeah. Cameron Carter Vickers was there to kind of bail him out, as was Joe Hart, you know, from with that save. Mm-hmm. Um but then that's what that's what a football team's all about, isn't it? It's, of course. hundred percent. I mean, if we had every player playing and firing on all cylinders, what a team we'd be. Mm. You know, you get performances out of James Forrest but you don't get them at the same time as you're getting the performances out of Jota. I imagine they were all firing on all cylinders. I mean, that is a prospect and a half. I had low expectations of Jota, I have to admit. I, I, when he came in, I just thought, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't look like he has the build to be a success here. Kind of looked a bit like a sort of, you know, lightweight, you know, I, I, I I just, I, I didn't, I hadn't heard much about him really. It was just this guy that we seemed to have plucked from Benfica and or the the sort of Benfica B team or whatever. hadn't I didn't watch any footage of him. If there was any showreels to be had, I didn't really watch them for whatever reason. I can't remember why I didn't. Um, I just thought, right, I'll judge him on what he does at Celtic. And I mean, he's it's it's actually a crime that he's not included in that Abada Kyogo Ange Sailor slash scooter song because he, he, he definitely deserves to be in there I want him. to see his Celtic showreel by the way yeah. but you're right I, I mean when you look at him he's, he's he was asked the question in one of the, the press conferences that we attended and which is now available on our YouTube channel about uh, the players he looked up to and he, meant, he name dropped Ronaldo Cristiano yeah. and, and obviously the Portuguese connection there's a great picture of him as a kid and Ronaldo and oh, he's yeah. getting his picture taken and all this and when you look and I'm not comparing the players but in terms of the style the straight back the, the kind of elegant look where you know he's not a jinky wee winger mm-hmm. um, you, you look at the style of Mikey Johnson when he gets the ball and the low centre of gravity and the, the body actually arches and all that he's not that type of player he's always straight back head up um, and the skills that he possesses are phenomenal. Mm. And, you know, we're, we're obviously putting him on a platform. He's the type of player that I wouldn't expect us to have for five years or ten years. Mm. Uh, David Boyle comes in to remind us that uh, we also have a new signing uh, coming in from Sligo Rovers, Johnny Kenny, €150,000. Uh, I would expect that would be one of these signings like Lawal, um, where they go into the B team. And obviously, we start to try and develop it from there. Um, but yeah, he is also age is he? coming in. I'll double check here. I think he's early 20s. Somebody might be able to give me a quick answer on we that. We were going against Hibs to get him, weren't we? Yeah, Hibs. And there was some interest from English football as well. So I think that guy that Hibs have got from Bodo Glimt could be pretty decent. I mean, I know he's only 19, but it seems to be... It seems to be a good signing for them. It does. It does. I Maloney's obviously hit the ground running on the transfer front. Monty is asking for specific interviewees to appear on Axom. I can't reveal who the big interviewees are going to be, Monty, but uh, they are 
they're going to interest you. Put it that way. They're definitely going to interest you. Um, so when you think about that, though, if we get Jota and Carter Vickers in, massive outlay, mm. would you then expect Celtic to probably um, then shop in the loan market if we're bringing anybody else in? Well, I mean, I guess obviously there's uncertainty over finance and that figure that was uh, banded about, about £2 million pounds, um, being shed every week. By he's 18, by the way. He's 18? Yeah, okay. he's younger than that. Yeah. Give him credit. Thank um, you. But that, that figure um, of, uh, of of £2 million pounds that's being you know shedded by clubs every week, that's that's a lot of money, you know, mm. and and you know, no, no matter how good our finances are or not great our finances are, we're we're not immune to to this uh, situation. So we just all, I really, really hope that 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 article is is correct. Last night, I mean, I, the guy that wrote it has been wrong before, so I, I'm, I certainly you know didn't read it and go right, okay, well that's. Are it. we talking off the scale? Billionaires, yes, all that, all right. yes, uh, we're definitely talking about that. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I'm not hanging my hat on, on that at all. Um, obviously, I hope that it's true, but um, but with regards to us and what we spend, you know, in, in the rest of the rest of this month, it just I guess it just depends who's available, you know, if there, if there is any deals to be done in a different market, you know, that we, we've been linked to Hans Wolf mm. and uh. Zinedine Ferhat, I think, as well as the other one, a French uh, or French Algerian uh, playmaker. Mm. Um, so I mean, I, I, it's it's kind of open season again. But I mean, we're only what six days into the transfer window, and our deals are notoriously late mm. in the day. You know, it's always sort of last minute dot com um, signings that we we're used to, and by and large, our January windows have been terrible. You know, like I, 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 I put up a picture of Maeda and said potentially best January signing ever. Mm. And, and you know, I'm I'm only bookmarking that in my mind because I don't know how it's going to play out. But I have I have a feeling that he's going to work out really well. Um, and you know, it, it's a pretty low, um, a low what's the word? A low benchmark or a low barometer to measure them against because we've not had that many successful January well, transfers. We've, we've signed the most expensive Scottish footballer of all time in Ollie Burke. Oh my God. Have you, did you see the uh, Instagram pictures of him? The other, oh. No. Where is he these days? Taking pictures of Sheffield himself. Wednesday. Taking pictures of himself in a lift wearing Sheffield United. Absolutely ridiculous clothing. Looking like he's in I don't know, a future scene in Bill and Ted's or something like that. Like these giant like green and black trainers and like this big black kind of like space jacket and shades on and all that. Just show us a goal. I know. Show, a goal. I know. I don't <laughs> want to see your watch in your gutties. Show us a goal. Now, Gary, I wasn't going to mention it, Gary Melrose, but seeing how you bring it up, you missed the opportunity, PJD, to roll out your Genola comparison again. Yeah, well, you know, Maida might be that Ferdinand type in the middle. We, we shall see. Uh, for Jota to aim his crosses at. Um, it's been a very enjoyable uh, built-in, but I'm not finished yet, JP, because I, how could I possibly talk about the effect and the impact in Japan without talking about that kind of Beatlemania impact that bands have when they go from the UK to Japan and they go on tour in Japan? I mean, they really are fanatical. Uh, and I think that, you know, although this these moves have not been prompted by that, the club will have a massive presence in the Japanese market. We can see it when we look at the viewers coming in to, to watch Axon, for yeah. example. Um, and the, the spike coming in from the Japanese viewers is incredible. So, you know, we talk about Celtic being recognisable over the, all over the globe. I think that's something to be proud of, not just from a marketing aspect, but the fact that, you know, it's been how long now? 15, 16 years since the Nakamura effect over there. And it's time to, to go back to them and say, remember us. Mm. I will just uh, thinking of you mentioned about bands going over to Japan. Have you ever seen an interview with Kyle Falconer online uh, with Tim Lovejoy? It was this uh, the gloves. Yes, yes, I it's, have seen that. I've, I've watched that many, many times. <laughs> um, I, th I, I think if you haven't seen that, find it online. Just type in Kyle Faulkner gloves. Does, does it come up with that? Because right. I used to just type in Kyle Faulkner B, like Channel B. Right. It was like a kind of offshoot. Internet channel. He's wearing a tracksuit. He's wearing a, a shell suit. He's, aye, because he's not been home from the night before. He was at a party and that that's all he had. I think he'd just been given 
a bunch of Adidas gear and he had no fresh clothes, so he put on a full, I think it's a red Adidas trackie. And but he's talking about how he's banned from Japan. Like at that in the interview, he's he's he he can't get into Japan and he's like, ah, oh. he's like, ah, oh, it's pure brilliant here in Japan. Eh? He's like he's like they just chuck Fred Perry stuff at you and all that. <laughs> Because <laughs> I've never seen anything like it, so I'm pretty gutted I kind of get back to Japan. Eh? And it's, it's so good because he's definitely still steaming and the rest from the night before. And uh, Tim Lovejoy that does his best to kind of keep the interview on track. Um, but it's 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 quite funny. But I know, I mean, like, if if you're seeing a, a, an impact and the viewing uh, figures from Japan, that's that's quite amazing. You know, that's and, incredible. I, I'd imagine that. The Australia thing as well will we'll, we'll, we'll pick up interest. I mean, there's always been that kind of interest in Celtic in Australia because of the expats and there's Celtic supporters clubs in Australia. Obviously, there's the podcast Celtic uh, Down Under. Mm. And, um, so, you know, it's, it's not as if we've ever been kind of off the radar in Australia, but I think the more Ange Postacoglu uh, gives sound bites and what sound bites he gives, by the way, you know, that one about. You know, I don't want to. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, this isn't the type of game I want to see. You know, I, I, don't, I want to play games with with fans and mate. Um, you know, things like that. And there's there's a whole host of them. You could make a. I'm pretty sure someone probably has made a post Coglu show reel. Yes. You know of of his best bits at Celtic, and he's only been here six months. So, um, I wonder if there's a show reel in me comparing uh, Jota to Ginola <laughs> probably know, probably uh, yeah that probably could uh, could be could be made up but, oh, the, uh, amount of, the amount of times I've said that I always thought Ralston was alright <laughs> I mean you did you did call it after that Livingston game I remember you know uh, well it was last January that was a year ago wasn't it listen I didn't get it right that often mate so you've Wait, got to a, a whole year ago oh yeah. my god yep. god that's so we were we were in Dubai a year ago right mm, now yeah. actually there in that in that sort of Six or seven days that we had off, it's absolutely mental. That's when the wheels fell off. Oh, yeah. big time! But listen, we got over it, we're still here, and um, we are hoping to be back at the Hibs game, um, in just a couple of weeks' time. So, 17th, it is Monday the 7th. I think it's Monday the 17th. I really, really hope I'm walking into a freezing cold Celtic Park that night and uh, saying all right to. Everybody around about me, Sean, who I think is in New Zealand right now, will probably listen to this. So hello, Sean. Um, and uh, yeah, just I, I really, really hope hope that's where we are because uh, just want to be there to support the team as as I wanted to be there all of last season as well. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's weird because when you're giving something back like we have been recently with gigs and football, and then it's taken away from you again. And, you know, before anybody starts playing the tiny violin, it's my life we're talking about here. This is my job. I work in live music. <laughs> I can't do my job right now. So, um, and I can't go to a football match. So, you know, if, if anybody wants to be disparaging about that, fine. But that's that's what keeps me going, you know. So mm. um, it's, it's hard when you've been... But the only good thing about it is that you know that we got it back, so we were going to get it back again. It's just how long that will be. And, and I really hope it's it's not long at all. No, I hope so as well. JP, it's always a, an absolute pleasure to have you in the studio, so thanks for joining us again. And thank you, everybody, for getting involved in the comment section. As I was saying before, get subscribing on YouTube. We're all about getting as many eyes as possible, not only on the daily stuff, but uh, on the big planned interviews and documentaries that we've got coming up in 2022 as well. Um, and, you know, we even bring people into the studio if they ask us nicely. So you and Boy Martin came in and he was brilliant, and that's up on the channel as well. Give it a, a look. He's always in the comments session. Uh, thanks again JP Mason for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. 